Welcome everybody. My name is Bill Inman and I am proud and excited to be here with you today for the first episode of the Decentralized Economy. And it's part of the Decentralized OS web series. We have a number of different topics and very thrilled that our very first guest is Michael Turpin. Now, first things first, uh, we're really excited because he made the time. Happy birthday, Michael. Today is your birthday. Thank you. So, so I hope you're having a great day. Um, and just that in itself, thank you for making the time to be with us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, and, and hopefully I won't embarrass you, but I'm going to give you a pretty thorough introduction here today uh, before we get into you, know, you pretty much carrying the conversation and me trying to make sure that the, uh, the listeners here uh, kind of can take in all of your wisdom, mm -hmm. which is what this is about. Um, I've watched a lot of your recent videos and a lot of it, you know, Bitcoin and, and about the crypto market. And a lot of it focuses on where are we at now? Where are we going to be in 2021, where we are today? But I really want to focus this interview on your philosophies about the decentralized economy, because as I get into the, your intro here, um, it's going to be really exciting because people don't, may, maybe don't understand who know you even that the breadth of experience and the journey you've had inside of the internet now going to different phases. So again, uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you don't know me, I'm also a blockchain and AI entrepreneur. I'm advising multiple companies in the space. Today's a big day for me because we just had a press release that job.com acquired a company that I'm a co-founder in. Uh, talenting, and uh, we have a blockchain patent here that's really strong, which Michael, I'm going to talk to you about uh, at some point here, uh, post this call. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit, you can see more about me on LinkedIn. I won't bore all of our, our, all of our listeners here with that just yet. You're going to hear from me over a series of episodes here in the coming months. Um, but let me kind of get into Michael Turpin. So Michael, obviously you're calling in today from, from Puerto Rico, uh, where you've right. lived for some time. I, by the way, I'm in Manhattan Beach here in Los Angeles. Um, we talked a little bit about it looks more sunny than it is in your background picture. But and yeah, and I actually um, lived in Manhattan Beach for a number of years as well. I did not know that. So we'll have a series of, of conversations there. You know, there's quite <laughs> a few crypto people here in Manhattan Beach these days, yes. as in Puerto Rico. So we'll have to share those stories and maybe contacts. Um, I'm going to talk about as well. I've been fortunate enough to be part of Michael's umbrella. I'm actually working with one of his organizations. And honestly, we don't get a chance. Michael and I don't get a chance to talk as much as we might think we would because I'm running the Los Angeles chapter. I'm a, I'm a, a co-city leader uh, with another gentleman in the Los Angeles chapter of his organization, Bit Angels. So, but let's backtrack. All right. So, so Michael, you are a serial entrepreneur, uh, really a um, vanguard of innovation in many ways, not just for cryptocurrency, where I didn't ask you if you like this or not in the pre-call. You're called the godfather of crypto. Uh, you right. People call you that a lot. So, that can go one of two ways, but ultimately means, hey, this powerful guy that knows what he's talking about. So let's listen to him. Uh, PR, marketing, innovation, and of course, crypto now. But more than that, to some degree, you've acquired a lot of wisdom that other people on this who are listening to this really should know about the decentralized economy. Uh, you're recognized as one of the top 100 people in blockchain by Cointelegraph. Uh, your company, the Tr Transform Group, is the world leader in, in uh, crypto and blockchain PR and advisory services. To that end, you've been part of over 150 token sales. Uh, you've advised over 300 clients in the industry, even some of the biggies like Ethereum, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, today as well. Uh, this is the part that I'm excited about and really using this as a foundation for the discussion today. You know, Previously in your career through PR companies, which you started through the advent of the internet, you, you advise companies very early on, like Motley Fool, America Online, and Earthlink. So some of the biggies back then, uh, you did PR for them. I'm not sure if you're responsible for all those CDs that we got back then. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, and, uh, and you were also featured in the Inc. 500 because not only were you advising the companies, you invested in many of them and did some bridge loans here or there and probably were, helped a lot of the brand names that we saw during that time and are still here stay alive. So thank you for that. Uh, you, you also founded Internet Wire in 1994. That became Market Wire. Uh, you raised $18 million from Hummer Winblad and Sequoia for that. So you were an innovator really early on, recognizing the power to disseminate information in the industry. You grew that company to be the world's third largest newswire company, finally acquired by NASDAQ in 2016 for, I believe, a $200 million uh, price tag. You, beyond you know, PR and marketing, 
you started another company, Social Radius, and started to advise social media, comp social uh, really enterprises on social media, Bombay Sapphire, Constant Contact, Marriott, and of course, AT&T, which we can get into or not, you have a different relationship with now. <laughs> <laughs> um, full circle. Um, and then thank you very much. You founded BitAngels, which is the premier global blockchain investor network for seed stage, early stage companies in blockchain. As I mentioned early in this call, uh, I help run, I co-lead the Los Angeles chapter, and we've been thrilled and excited to be a part of that organization. And hopefully I've come up with some good content there. So also, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to run out of breath in a minute, but I hate to embarrass you, but also you're the founder of Coin Agenda the first and largest conference series connecting blockchain and crypto investors. And I've been to the, the, the events in Las Vegas and always just lively, lots of activity, some of the world's biggest names in the industry there. Going way back, you uh, have your master's in fine arts from SUNY Buffalo and a dual, dual bachelor's from Syracuse in journalism and English literature. And in 2000, they actually inducted you at Syracuse into their wall of fame at the Newhouse School of Public Communication. So. There's much more <laughs> that, I, that, that uh, I could have continued to write bullets and I had to look at my notes for that. That would have been hard script for you know, even George Clooney to memorize for a movie. Um, and we really wanna focus, Michael, on your strategic thoughts and your wisdom around all that. So again, thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate being here and we'll take you know, about a half an hour from now to gain your thoughts on everything. So appreciate you being here, Michael. Great, thank you for the great uh, introduction. Yeah, I think, I think that's really necessary because again, a lot of the, 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 the things that you're in today, they focus on the day-to-day -day stuff, but you have, there's much more here. So the theme of the channel and the theme of this conversation is the decentralized economy. So I'm gonna ask you a very broad question to start. It probably will take us many places, but in general, with your experience, with your background, what's the future of the decentralized economy? Well, I think what we saw just in the recent weeks with the Wall Street bets uh, just upending Wall Street um, and the systems there, and I think Wall Street's never going to be the same. Uh, you're going to find industry after industry that um, gets touched by, you know, a combination of, uh, you know, uh, crowdsourcing, which was around before. Um, you, you know, you had this evolution. I mean, in the early days of the internet, you had peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, the internet itself, uh, you know, was really peer-to-peer -peer nodes instead of like, you know, centered down. And um, I remember when Mark Andreessen, who was, you know, just an incredible pivotal figure in, in, you know, the entire last, uh, you know, 30 plus years of uh, innovation. I mean, just look at all, all he's done. And he's still, I think, in his 50s or something. Um, you know, he, he basically was the person who created the browser when he was in, 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 in college, uh, you know, it was under a Larry Smars grant uh, at, uh, you know, University of Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana. But um, that became Netscape. And a lot of people don't realize it also became Internet Explorer and it also became Mozilla because um, they originally wanted to call it Mosaic Com Computer Corporation. And uh, the university said, no, no, that's our name. And they ended up selling it to a company that sold to, uh, to um, uh, Microsoft and became uh, IE. But uh, I remember the point I bring it up is that when he started, uh, I think it was called Loud Cloud that he sold for like a billion and change to uh, people forget that part of his background. Uh, you know, obviously Netscape did really well. Um, and uh, Loud Cloud, you know, got sold for like a billion and change, I think to Hewlett Packard. And, but he, I remember in the nineties uh, made a proclamation at like an internet world or one of these other conferences that doesn't exist now. Uh, and he said, um, you know, client server is dead. And I was like, what do you mean client server is dead? Client server is like replace the mainframe and it's like the leading thing. And he said, the cloud is gonna take over everything. And he was right. And then, you know, I, I believe he also said software eats the world, right? And, uh, you know, with, with him being able to go and, you know, start Andreessen Horowitz as the only top tier firm that was not started in the 1970s or 80s. I mean, it's really an old boy network when you go to raise the big bucks from Stanford and Yale and all these endowments that are necessary uh, to be able to get the best deals and the best investors and the best referrals. And he was able to, you know, have the pedigree to break break through that for a fund that was not started in the 70s and 80s, but was started in the 2000s. And, uh, you know, that's just an incredible, uh, and, and his track record speaks to it. And I think he's got like a billion under management now plus. So, uh, you know, 
what he's been able to show in that innovation has been really kind of something that I've also looked at, which is, you know, how you're able to show software eating the world, how you're able to show the path from, you know, all these things are connected. The, you know, the early uh, ethos of the internet, um, which was that uh, uh, I, I used to have a t-shirt that was electronic freedom foundation t-shirt that said, uh, you know, the internet treats censorship as damage and routes around it. Uh, you know, that's the opposite, of course, the, of, of what uh, the ethos of, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter are being accused of these days um, and the stacks. Well, decentralization, you know, it's kind of the, uh, you know, that was kind of the empire strikes back on the Internet by saying, hey, you may have built it, but we own it. And, um, you know, now it's like, um, you know, with the ability to have social networks and everything that was built by the bigger companies and is now being attacked. Uh, there is this now new wave of companies trying to go and use decentralization and tokenization to basically make it of the people, by the people, for the people. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, every category that you're looking at that got changed, just like it went from mainframe to, uh, to client server to cloud, now to blockchain. And so just like when I first saw you know, my, my first browser in 1993, when I downloaded Mosaic, I was like, oh my God, this is going to change the world. When I typed in Louvre.fr and saw all the paintings in France without having, I was used to local area networks where I would, you know, go and connect to a computer in the next room. Uh, you know, before that it was sneaker net as they used to call it, running around with the floppy disk. Just having, just having a local area network was a big innovation, but right. to be able to go and have your local network extend to the world that was, I mean, hence World Wide Web. I mean, that was the huge innovation that really, you know, made possible everything that's built on top of it, social media in the 2000s. And uh, then, you know, when I saw my first social network, um, you know, I was like, oh my God, this is going to change the world. And uh, and again, it wasn't a very, I mean, I kind of saw uh, six degrees and it, it, to me, it just seemed more closer to like the communities of like, you know, Zoom and GeoCities, um, you know, and I knew both of those founders. I mean, GeoCities was David Bonet out of Los Angeles. I was, I was in LA there and uh, almost worked with him, but he thought that they were competing against Earthlink because they originally were not going to be a community. They were going right. to be an ISP. And then we ended up working with Zoom that, you know, ended up, you know, going public and then getting merging with uh, Snap and becoming a, you know, multi-billion dollar um, uh, company at the height of the ICO frenzy. Sorry, IPO frenzy, different frenzy. Right. And, and then it crashed from being multi-billions to, you know, going, it didn't go bust. It got acquired for like chump change or aqua higher value right. uh, by, Ge by General Electric, who was its, uh, you know, one of its, um, you know, strategic uh, investors. Um, and so, you know, that kind of happened then in the early days of the uh, blockchain as well. Um, you know, the blockchain and the internet, you know, Mark Twain, you know, uh, uh, was quoted as saying, uh, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it tends to rhyme. And uh, you see that between the growth of uh, different waves uh, of the, um, you know, the internet, of uh, social media, and uh, the mobile phone. I mean, you know, begin, in the beginning, you know, everybody's just like, oh, this is a joke, you know, Twitter, who cares what I'm having for breakfast, the personal computer, you know, why would I want something you know, like that clunky at home? What am I going to do? Have my wife store recipes on it? I mean, nobody thought anybody was going to, and, you know, took a Bill Gates to say, Microsoft, our vision is to have, uh, you know, a computer on every desk in America and to have Microsoft software running on it. Big vision when he was a 19 year old in Albuquerque, you know, hacking away at code. But, you know, do you know any uh, computer that doesn't have Microsoft something on it? I mean, you know, it, 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 it came true, you know, and, yeah. and again, that's sort of like the power of entrepreneurs being able to build centralized systems. And now we're all of a sudden in a world where you can build decentralized systems where you can still be, uh, you know, uh, successful and still cause, you know, create personal wealth and, and jobs, but you can also, you know, have the, your customers profit from it as well. Whereas like, you know, when you're talking about all the controversies of Facebook and, and, and Google and, you know, uh, the, the big tech as they call them now, uh, it's because, you know, they're profiting, their shareholders are profiting, but they're profiting, you know, at the expense of their users. And, uh, you know, I think the pendulum may be swinging too far because obviously it's a consensual agreement, but it's a consensual agreement because they, they have no other choice. And the decentralized economy is going to give them a choice. 
Yeah, I am. Um, wow, I, I love the conversation so far. Thank you for, you know, just a lot of the millennials and um, Gen Z, especially, and certainly Gen Alpha, don't know who Mark Andreessen is. He's still in the news, <laughs> but not like he was in the 90s when he was a seminal figure, still is a seminal figure in the industry. And of course, the browser changed everything because now you could read information in a user friendly way. And that's a key to technology is being able to do that. Uh, so many things. I, I, I took some notes and you're right. You know, the shift in power from Sand Hill Road, which is which in, in Silicon Valley, where all the investments in Andreessen was, is certainly still happening. happening. And it's really interesting. Uh, you used a quote from Mark Train and, and decentralized. I felt when I was thinking of is, is the beginning of the internet was somewhat decentralized. That was the philosophy. And then it became centralized. And now it's becoming decentralized. It's like breathing, right? It's like the exhale, the inhale is centralizing. Then you hold your breath, hold your breath. And you're like, I can't do this anymore. And then you exhale. And we're kind of at that point where we've held our breath and there's a lot of strain, a lot of pent up energy that needs to be exhaled back to decentralization. And um, I wouldn't doubt that we're going to see that breath happen over and over again over time and keep iterating, especially with new emerging technology. So let me get let me go high level with you, though. So you've seen many cycle and waves now with new technology. Right. And you seem to be on the, and you are not even seem to be you are on the bleeding edge of where things are going. How do you identify, and, and I understand these are macro things, internet, crypto, but there's many things you could, you could dive into now from you know, quantum to AR, VR to robotics and what have you. How do you look at an industry and get passionate about it? Like what drove you back then to be so involved in the internet and crypto today? I guess it's just the personal excitement I get by seeing something and saying, this is going to change the world and I can contribute to it. I mean, I'm not a, uh, a medical doctor. So, I mean, I can't really contribute that much to biotech, even though I think it's going to do cool things. Uh, you know, life extension, I think, you know, is a little bit different because I can at least help communicate some of the visions. Cause I know a lot of like the, you know, life extension guys who sound crazy, but they've actually got a, a vision. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be one of the next big waves, you know, extending human life. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is on the medical side, part of it's on the biotech side, and, you know, and it'll have its issues too with, uh, you know, with what happens with DNA and, and, you know, I mean, obviously we're all wearing masks because of COVID and, you know, there's a lot of theories about, you know, was that accidental, like, you know, the 1918, 1919 flu, or was that, you know, a bioweapon? And, you know, I mean, as we, and of course people also from Elon Musk on down talk about, you know, AI as being something that could, you know, really help uh, the human race or could destroy it. I mean, you know, kind of replay, you know, uh, you know, Hal, I wouldn't do that from, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, but I think that uh, I get excited about things that can affect, you know, uh, industries that I'm familiar with. And if it's consumer goods or if it's, you know, entertainment or if it's uh, travel, something that I can say, oh, I, I can see how this can make something better. And I can, you know, find companies that are on the bleeding edge and, you know, help advise them because I've seen cycles uh, and, uh, you know, I just use my creativity to help them, you know, kind of tweak that final piece of the model. I mean, really what I enjoy the most is being an advisor to companies. I mean, I enjoy being an entrepreneur and, and building things. Um, I'm usually not the best person to run it after it gets to be a hundred people because I'm like off to the next idea or I'm trying to bring in the next new product line where it's like, no, no, no. You know, your investors like, we want to focus on this one. Let's maximize this one out. So you need to have a team that has, you know, somebody who is really good at just doing the same thing every day and making little minor incremental improvements. And, you know, I have to find those people. And, I, 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 you know, I think I've done a good job of finding those people. Uh, you know, Erica at, uh, has been with me since the beginning of Bit Angels. Um, you know, Xenia, who runs the, is president of the PR group. She's been actually with me 20 years across the um, transform and, and Turpin group and, uh, social radius. So, uh, I've, I've, I've had her working, uh, you know, running things for me at different areas, uh, you know, longer than I've been with my wife and longer than she's been with her husband. So it's been a good right. relationship. A long, and, uh, your work, your work, you know, wise, with, with, your, uh, work your work, uh, relatives basically. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and with, uh, with market wire, um, you know, when it was originally internet wire, I mean, Michael Schuler was, uh, working at my PR firm and I came up with the idea of, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, a press release service that would work on satellites because I was getting a number of uh, clients of ours saying, you know, please, whatever you do, don't put it on business wire or peer newswire because, um, 
they fax it to us because if you weren't in the Associated Press, which is only 600, you know, Associated Press is a nonprofit group. So that people didn't all have to send reporters to get killed to report on it. They would sort of like, you know, send one to this battle and one to that battle and they would get the story or they'd get killed. But uh, they didn't have to all get killed. I mean, that's, that's the truth. That's the, the background of uh, the Associated right. Press. And they eventually ended up sharing satellite uh, dishes when, you know, when television came out and they were able to go and take clips back and forth. And both Pierre Newswire and Businesswire, I mean, they, they had that as their background, their backbone. Um, actually, Pierre Newswire started out with uh, Western Union, <laughs> telegrams. And so I looked and said, well, you know, using fax machines and satellites to distribute small amounts of text, the internet is perfect for this. And so that was the big idea that I had in 92, really, and uh, kind of found that Mosaic was the perfect uh, engine to build it on. And uh, so Michael Schuler, who was my, it was working as an account executive my, at the Turpin Group, I basically said, hey, you know, why don't you uh, try and help me make this thing work? Sell one press release and I'll move you over full time. And he did. And, you know, he worked with me up through the uh, sale of the company. And then I put him into a couple of other companies that I was working with. And he did some stuff on his own. And then I just recently dragged him back. And now he's running a, a new entity that we have called Content Syndicate, which has Blockchain Wire, which is partnered with our, with, uh, with the old company, uh, uh, which, you know, NASDAQ then uh, sold it um, to Apollo. And it's now called Globe Newswire. It's still the third largest, but uh, creeping up on number two. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at doing some interesting things with not only distributing blockchain content, but also tokenizing uh, uh, news and, and content. Good, good segue there. It's really fascinating to see the history. And, and, it, and I think the key there was that you look for things that you're passionate about where you can make a difference. And of course, you're, you're able to recognize technologically where there's a competitive advantage that people haven't seen yet. And that's what you did in the internet era with PR and communications, and of course, with crypto too. So quick shout out. Yeah, Erica's fantastic at BitAngels. I work with her often. So let's, let's mention her here. Also shout out to my friend, Warren Whitlock, who you've known for some time, who ultimately was the guy who introduced me to BitAngels and, and ultimately here you as well. Absolutely. So, who's an all around great guy and a, and a great thought leader. Okay, so um, so many good things there. You know, I wanna do one more entrepreneurial thing before we get into the, like heavy tokenization. You take action. So a lot of the people that are, uh, in, of course, through BitAngels and everywhere else, you know, you have an idea, you see the market, but what's different about you is that you take action and you get results. Now, you talked about the fact that you have great people that work with you and help build these decentralized e economy, crypto companies, and even your marketing. What drives you to take action? Are you, are you, are you not afraid to take risk or you have that free time or, or you, you don't sleep or what is it? <laughs> um, my wife would probably say I don't sleep. Um, but uh, no, I think that uh, if I get a new idea and I don't act on it, I see somebody else build something and then sell for a million or whatever. I was just like, hey, you know, I had that idea and I don't want to, you know, kind of be like what it could have, should have. I, I, I like to be able to go and at least see if it works. And, you know, I, but I, I, I will kill ideas in the crib too. I mean, I, I, I don't go and struggle up hill when it's clear that something's not working. I mean, I've certainly had a couple of things that didn't... Uh, yeah, so who, say, uh, who let the dogs out? Poodle, poodle. Can I hold <laughs> hold the? Can I hold monkey up? This is the There's cutest the, uh, poodle in history. Your advisor. Yeah, this is you my are. advisor, monkey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you've got a staff back there. That's your handlers. So good for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, we're, we're we're just setting up. Uh, the, I think I mentioned uh, part of the interview. Uh, I had a birthday present myself. It was like sort of a elaborate kind of home gym that fits into the condo that I have here. Uh, so it's very compact, but uh, very cool. And so they just finished uh, assembling it. And so I'll be uh, working out when we're, when we're done with this. I love it. There's going to be so much change just this decade and beyond. It's important as a side note to stay fit just so we can be around to enjoy it all. So I, that's, it's an exciting time to live. Exactly. So um, just let's, let's go back. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the FOMO side, fear of missing out is really drives you and, and gets you into things. And, you know, a lot of people on this call are entrepreneurs, they're crypto investors. And sometimes you just have to go with your gut and take a risk. That's what it's all about. And you got to risk your time and sometimes your money and, and you've done that in, in, in spades. So let's talk about tokenization now in, in, in a broad sense, mm -hmm. you know, tokenization of everything, right? That's, that's probably where we're going. We're going to have a new global economy, possibly a global stable coin that's going to underpin many different other types of coins. Give us your overarching vision. And from a, from a long-term perspective, you can blend in short if you like, on where we're going with this decentralized economy when it comes to tokenization and, and new currency. 
Well, I, I, I believe that tokenization is actually even more important than decentralization. I think they're both important. Uh, my, you know, original co-founder and friend and fellow investor in a lot of uh, uh, projects, David Johnston, um, you know, uh, when we, you know, early on when we started the, uh, the Bid Angels um, uh, uh, DApps fund, you know, you invested in Ethereum and a lot of the early uh, um, uh, tokens uh, that uh, Bid Angels did the, the seed investment and we had a structured fund in early 2014, we raised 10,000 Bitcoin, uh, you know, back when it was worth about 600 bucks a, a pop. Um, but, you know, we get a nice return on that. Um, you know, he uh, has this thing called Johnson's Law. Uh, which is anything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. And I basically have Turpin's corollary of uh, Johnson's law, which is anything that can be tokenized will be tokenized. And I think that why tokenization is um, more important over the next 50, 100 years, um, you pick your time period, uh, is that not everything needs to be decentralized, but everything that can be tokenized should be tokenized. So in other words, if you're talking about, you know, stocks, Apple stock is never going to, you know, be decentralized. You know, Tim Cook or his, you know, his successor in coming years is not going to say, hey, let's just go and decentralize the management of Apple. I mean, you're not going to decentralize every company. There are still entrepreneurs who are going to want to build, you know, the mom pa store on the corner that then grows to, you know, if you're, hardworking in the right time and the right place, be the next Amazons and the and Apples. And, uh, but on the other hand, there's no reason why you have to have all these, you know, gatekeepers, middlemen um, in arcane systems to be able to buy stock. I mean, what's, what's ridiculous uh, to me is that most people don't realize that Apple doesn't know who its shareholders are. Because when you actually buy Apple stock, you don't even own Apple stock. There's this, there's this group called the DTCC, the Depository Trust uh, uh, Company, um, you know, Google it, uh, that basically owns all stock. And you're basically just sort of like, you know, getting to use it, but they, they're the ones who are, are, are safeguarding it. And, you know, they get to do some really interesting, profitable things, you know, uh, when you're not doing things with it. And there's no reason for things that were invented in the, you know, in the 30s with the 33, 34 Act, in the 40s with the, the Howey test. I think the VTCC came in, in the 60s, I believe. And that was because NASDAQ showed that you didn't have to have guys running around on the floor holding up pieces of paper to each other and seeing, you know, what they said. And, oh, you know, we need that. We can't, we can't you know, go and, uh, you know, automate markets. We need to have these, these guys on the floor, you know, that uh, just spit fire out and, the, and they have relationships with each other to trade stock. Guess what? That's gone. I actually um, was, you know, friends with a, a client of mine in the '90s whose uh, family owned three seats on the New York Stock Exchange, and it was a big deal when I'd have breakfast that he would invite me to the members' lounge of the New York Stock Exchange, and we were, you know, literally, you know, looking over the floor when the market would open and people would be running back and forth. And I remember him telling me because he was an internet guy. He said, "It's a shame that in three or four years all this will be gone," and it was. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, what's, that's what the, uh, the great equalizer of the blockchain is going to do to industry after industry after industry. There is no particular reason that we need to have a New York Stock Exchange. Um, because right now, you have to go and find out why you have to go. And, you know, if you want to buy Apple stock in France, it's not that easy. If you want to buy a French stock in the U.S., you have to buy depository receipts. And you have all these middlemen. And they all have this, you know, T3 where they get to hold each other's money and make little margins on it all the way. Uh, and then you get people trying to hack it with different technologies and, uh, you know, ultra high frequency traders. When you have a tokenized system and you have a token that represents a share of Apple stock, and then you end up having marketplaces like Binance, but it would be the Binance for stocks. And yeah, you know, countries will decide what in their jurisdiction is, uh, is legal or is uh, regulations there, but you should have a global marketplace where anybody wants to buy Apple stock can buy it. And guess what? Apple can see who owns it and they can airdrop them gifts. I mean, that's the future of stocks. Yeah. That, I mean, it's the it, DTCC cent centralization at its finest behind the, behind the wizard of Oz veil there, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. There's a lot of money in the float and I'm sure they do quite well with that, uh, obviously. Yep. So, and then you talked about the other powers that be countries and things of that nature. So thank you for that, by the way, it's, it's great to remind everybody that what we think is a free market isn't necessarily a free market and eliminating intermediaries, both through tokenization, but also 
you've got pockets of centralized power then just some of them can dissipate along the way and it'll it'll make everything faster and you know from uh, being an entrepreneur startup guy I just think about how quickly a good idea is going to be capitalized in this new digital economy or decentralized economy if you will where a good idea people can get the money in that in that right away um, there, there may be less of a requirement, right, to be uh, obviously a wealthy individual and, and take all the tests to actually infuse your money in there. But it's going to be really interesting. So um, that well, being I was going to say, as, as somebody who lived in Las Vegas for a number of years, um, I think that the entire accredited investor phenomenon is a scam. I think that it's something that came out of, you know, the early days of Wall Street when literally there were hucksters on the literal Wall Street, the street in New York called and people would go down in the eighth stock and they didn't know if the person was reputable or not. They'd sell them stock that didn't exist or that they said, oh yeah, buy some AT&T T stock. And it wasn't really the AT&T stock. And so that's what the 33 and 34 act that was, you know, they always, you know, sort of uh, make the laws after the horses run away and uh, you know, the, the barn is on fire. So that was the reaction to the abuses of the 1920s that led to the, the great crash of 29. Among other things, which the main the main things were actually government uh, missteps and uh, monetary supply, like we may be seeing right now, um, and uh, you know the things that Herbert Hoover did. So, but they decided, oh, let's go and you know protect the little guy, but you know it had the effect of protecting the rich. And uh, you know there is no particular reason why you can go to Las Vegas, and no matter what you're worth, you can bet your entire net worth on you know red or black on a solitaire game and nobody is going and make you say sign disclosures and you know i didn't realize that i was going to lose all my money they even they even give you free drinks while you're making your decision to, to bet all your money and yet you know you are told that if you only make one hundred eighty thousand a year instead of two hundred thousand, you're not smart enough to be able to go and buy shares in the next facebook and if they simply got rid of that, I mean, there have been some things saying, well, maybe a halfway step is you have to take a class to show that you understand what, you know, investments are, then it's not money raining down from the sky. But I mean, just think of the boom as we're now coming out of uh, the second great, you know, recession slash depression in, 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 in the course of 12 years. Um, if you could go and let everybody who wants to invest money um, invest money. How many jobs would that create? Not just in blockchain, but in, you know, I mean, the, the startup economy overall and, and the, you know, the amount of jobs, the amount of wealth that would, that would create when even that 5% of startups that actually survive, uh, you know, identify and hire the best people from the ones that don't. I mean, it's the Darwinian nature of, um, of, uh, of capitalism you know, is what actually is, is the best case. You want to go and make sure maybe that there's still a safety net, which I think we've been doing a, a lousy job of, but it's not because of the accredited investor laws. Oh, absolutely not. You know, the Adam Smith, the invisible hand and the gut wrenching risk that people would take on on their self, they'll, they'll qualify themselves whether they want to take a risk or not. And that's where we're going in this in this new decentralized economy. So all those are all those are really good points. So let's um let's talk a little bit about specific tokenization now. And I want to get back to kind of the powers that be and talk about governments in the process. But first, before we go there, you have a lot of great clients that you're working today. You know, one of my old favorites going back to the 70s and 80s things, Atari, right? You work with them, for example, and, yes. and modernize. Can you tell us about how some of your clients of present or past are tokenizing and some of the innovative things they're doing? Sure. Well, I think the two most exciting things right now are uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, and NFTs. And that's the, I mean, that's what's powering the second wave of Ethereum, right? I mean, you know, Ethereum's first use case was, uh, was the ICO. It was the ERC-20 token that let, uh, that democratized the ability of anybody to go out and, uh, you know, raise money. And the problem is that they really didn't have a lot of guidelines around it. They didn't have a lot of best practices. And, you know, forget about the scams. There were just also people who just simply got funded on FOMO and really were not the best and the brightest people out there to be given $50 million. And, uh, you know, and then basically just shovel it over to a company where they just had salaries for life and they never built anything and they didn't feel to have a moral responsibility to keep the blockchain afloat. And so the private company was there. And I think that, you know, that happened with the dot coms too. But with the dot coms, um, you know, I think that it their failure still ended up paving the way for the unicorns that happened afterwards. And the survivors, there were certainly survivors from there. 
I mean, it was a brutal shakeout and people were saying short Amazon at $5, another one of these stupid dot coms, but you know, one of the best investments you could have made in 2002, I think it was, was Amazon was at $5 and you had a lot of analysts saying short it and uh, you know, went up to 3000. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think with Ethereum, it's second life because you literally had people saying, you know, Ethereum is going to die. You know, it's, uh, it's got, you know, it's old technology. Uh, you know, it's, it cloned and copied. Therefore, it has no value. I mean, it got down to about $80, I think, when uh, I believe it was someone from Ripple or Stellar uh, had, had called out, uh, you know, it's had a little, you know, flame war with Vitalik and said, uh, you know, anybody, or I think he was using it, but you can Google this. It was like buzzword coin. I can create buzzword coin and it can go and be a clone of Ethereum and it can do everything Ethereum does, which means that Ethereum will go to zero. And then Vitalik, uh, you know, who's genius, you know, I, I, I worked with him, you know, on, on the whole, you know, kind of first, first year out there. Um, but, you know, he was very logical and he gave a logical answer. He said, technically correct. And then he started explaining why Ethereum 2.0 was going to solve this. People just heard technically correct and sold Ethereum and just said, oops, okay, it's going to zero. And that's when it got down to about $80. Now, that was only about a year and a half ago, I think it was, you know, it was during, you know, kind of the, I, I, I have this thing about the four seasons of uh, Bitcoin, which really becomes the four seasons I really seasons like that. We'll that here. Go ahead, please. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was, that was sort of like right during the period crypto winter that people believed the worst. And uh, instead of, uh, you know, what Anthony Diorio and David Johnson have always told me, which is never bet against Vitalik. And uh, so far, anybody betting against Vitalik, it's been a, it's been a bad bet, bet. And, uh, you know, he's not about to retire. I think he's what, 25 by now. I mean, you know, it's just like, right. you know, he's still very young. He started there when he was 19. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the next wave is not just one, but two things, right? I mean, you now have, uh, you now have uh, the ability, I mean, you still have the ability to go and raise money in a ERC-20 token. And you've got more developers for, for the Ethereum uh, landscape than like you know, probably the next five combined. I mean, obviously, Polkadot, X Ethereum guy is promising Cardano. X Ethereum guy is promising. So they're still kind of coming out of that Ethereum ecosystem, uh, but they are uh, <laughs> innovating and doing cross chain and doing you know uh, you know innovations on top of on top of what existed before. And the community all really you know Bitcoin maximalist notwithstanding, uh, really does support one another. And uh, you know and they want to see it get you know to the next level. And uh, you know the nice thing is that. With blockchains, unlike companies where the board comes in and sells you off for chump chain, as long as the blockchain is still running, as long as someone's mining it or paying for one server, it can go retool itself and, uh, you know, and, and, and get going again. Whereas, you know, one of the problems with a lot of the dot-com failures uh, were that the board just said, nope, you know, too much liability. We're going to pull the plug and sell you off for chump change. And, uh, you know, a number of the, you know, some of the biggest dot bombs, right? Uh, one of them was called Den. Brock Pierce was one of the three founders there. It was basically YouTube before YouTube, but you didn't have the capability of doing short form videos and having people watch it on, on uh, you know, before broadband was out there. Yeah. And so right idea, wrong time. You know, Chad Hurley came up a few years later and, you know, made YouTube. And, you know, that's now arguably the most valuable part of uh, Google. And uh, so, you know, I mean, it's just, it's timing is so much in this marketplace. And, uh, you know, so... Getting back to the original question, um, you know, decentralized finance and NFTs are really what we're working on right now. What I'm excited about, I, I pretty much, you know, um, spent about 90% of my time, uh, you know, incubating companies and advising companies. And I'm really focused on those, those, those areas. Um, right, I mean, on the DeFi space, just to name some ones that I've been working with over the last few weeks, because it's been a really exciting time. Um, Bridge Mutual. Um, is has gone in four days to being, uh, you know, startup to the largest decentralized insurance company. They passed a half a billion dollar, uh, you know, authorized market cap. Um, so they passed the Nexus Mutual, which had been out for like a, a year and change. And uh, they just had, you know, faster, better, cheaper DeFi model and uh, just a great team. And, uh, you know, just uh, the, the need for speed is just Stunning. I mean, I thought I wasn't able to catch up in, uh, to the pace in 2017. Now it's like, you know, you just, you know, sleep and you get up in the morning and you've lost, you know, 17 opportunities. It's just, <laughs> you know, so you, you definitely have to be kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, on, 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 on pace and focused and, you know, eliminate the distractions. I mean, in 2015, 
uh, at Transform, I made the tough decision to do two things. Uh, number one, I um, fired all my non-crypto clients. I just said, I don't have time for you anymore. I'll find you somebody else. You know, unless you're going to go and tokenize what you have, unless you're going to go, I just don't have time to work with enterprise software if you don't have time to do this. Um, you know, I mean, I made one or two exceptions for people like Philips, who, by the way, did have a blockchain division. Um, but uh, for the most part, everybody that I was working with who was not going to be, you know, doing that. Uh, uh, and, and I also, you know, sort of um, changed the name from Transform PR to Transform Group because, um, I wanted to not just be, you know, the biggest PR firm in crypto, but to be the, um, the biggest, um, you know, sort of services group in crypto that happened to have the biggest PR firm as well. And that allowed me to really, you know, kind of, you know, brand coin agenda and, and, uh, and, and bit angels and under a separate wing and to be able to, uh, really grow the advisory side of the business. And, uh, you know, that's really what I what I get joy and passion out of now is, uh, you know, I mean, when you've been in PR for, you know, 30 something years, uh, you know, you, you don't quite get the same thrill of, you know, getting a placement in the Wall Street Journal. And they're done that. I mean, it's still nice to say, hey, you know, they got it right or whatever. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I've got other people that get, can do that. That's a trainable, teachable, relationship oriented thing. Whereas coming up with the idea that's going to take, uh, a company that's going in the wrong direction and turning them around to get back on the track of being a, a billion dollar potential. I mean, that's something that I think that, you know, to be immodest, I think that maybe, you know, me and a couple of dozen other people have the, you know, deep experience and, and practice of being able to do for a company. And so that's, I've got, I've got more, more advisory work than I can handle right now and I can't clone me. So I'm looking to, you know, build out some, uh, you know, kind of back-end assistance uh, really right here in San Juan because there's actually some great talent here. And, um, you know, and then of course the PR firm is, you know, global and, you know, Xenia's in the Bay Area. And like, you know, uh, we have a you know, great new head of the uh, New York office that we brought in two years ago. And everybody else has been with me an average of about 10 years. So I guess I'm, you know, letting yeah, wow. them kind of like, you know, I, I try to be Phil Jackson about management. I, I just let them do stuff in their own way and just kind of point them in general and, and show lessons when they you maybe aren't doing the right thing all the time. Yeah, and having coming from Phil Jackson is a great way, coming from a level of wisdom that transcends the actual game of basketball, transcends the game of crypto. It's about helping companies. And you're right, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, crypto organizations and, and companies in blockchain um, they have a great idea, but they don't know, they don't have the business insight and so forth. So helping them in that nature is actually really critical, especially if it's one you love. So DeFi insurance, right? So de decentralized insurance, how do we, how do we not FOMO ourselves? How do we stay in touch with what's going to be four days away? I mean, come on now, is it coin agenda? Is it bit angels? Do we, do we scour YouTube? You know what, how do we know what's coming next? of all of the above, right? I mean, uh, you start out by just going to the accessible, um, you know, Telegram, look at all the channels on Telegram. And, you know, you have this thing called Coin Market Cap and Coin Gecko, and they will go in and, you know, if you don't have the relationships, you make the relationships. Um, everybody asks, how do I buy crypto? It's like, the question should be, how do you earn crypto? Most of the crypto that I have, I didn't buy, I earned. And, you know, that way you actually get relationships with it instead of just simply having a whole bunch of screens and not actually know anybody in the space. And by advising. And, uh, you know, great story. Is that how you earned it? By advising? By advising, by advising, by taking, you know, tokens that were worth almost nothing as part of my fees for the agency. I mean, you know, the first uh, crypto client that we had was, uh, you know, was, uh, was, was MasterCoin. And we took, you know, Bitcoin and MasterCoin. And, you know, Bitcoin was $100 at the time. So I didn't take any cash. And a lot of agencies would have been like, well, it tells when you have U.S. dollars, you know. And so, uh, you know, I hate taking U.S. dollars these days. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will just because, you know, I, I pay my people, at least, you know, the, the full-time employees, um, you know, in U.S. dollars. But, uh, you know, I uh, in a bull market, I don't want to take dollars. I want to take uh, things that I believe are going to 2-3x because uh, I know the U.S. dollars are going to, at best, uh, you know, 0.9x in terms of like, you know, what their relative value today versus a year from now are going to be. 
such such a great lesson for all entrepreneurs and people that are in business and and who want to listen you don't always have to have the capital you can help advise but you got to be more do more which you've done right you're able to take an idea and broadcast that idea as a meme across the world and of course you have to run it through your own filter and lens and you have your own integrity yeah. because your word is everything to you and but when you I, see something now absolutely. You listen to and it's simply by being somebody and and being able to have that outreach people throw their tokens at you and to a point now where you have to say, I can't just can't do it unless you have a big vision. So I, well, I, I mean, I, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, I feel, I feel, you know, uh, most, uh, I, I feel bad when I turn someone down because they, they just didn't seem like they were quite something that was going to work out. And then they end up like proving me wrong and become like a top hundred token. Right. And so on the other hand, you don't want to go and take something where you had a gut feeling that it might not be, right and then they end up being a scam but i mean i got a pretty good scam filter i mean out of the 150 tokens i think two of them ended up like you know kind of like you know being scams and i i cut those really quickly yeah um, on another well that's your secret sauce i think but on another on another webinar or another conference or call you can you can go through that that's that'd be really exciting let me let me this this is really fascinating so far and again i wanted to get into your wisdom and have people understand your decision making. Because ultimately, in a decentralized economy, individuals are going to have to evaluate where they want to put their money, where they want to take their risk, where they want to spend their money. And I think you're giving them a good base here with your sensibilities around the industry. Big picture, let's go back. Uh, the powers that be. And, and maybe this is the kind of the seminal overarching question that kind of takes us into 2030, a decentralized economy. Are countries going to allow de uh, tokenization of everything? Uh, are they going to... Oh, well, they're absolutely going to go and um, they're incented to go and, uh, you know, tokenize uh, their own fiat currency because that's the best way for them to collect taxes on everything. You literally get rid of, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's so funny when, when uh, Janet Yellen, you know, said at, at first during the hearing, which she then clarified in, in, in uh, you know, kind of a written statement that like, I don't want to, you know, you know, slow down innovation in the financial sector. But you know, when she said that uh, cryptocurrency is a big problem with like, you know, terrorist funding and like, you know, money laundering. And yet, you know, the government, the US government is one of the biggest, you know, um, buyers of research from, you know, the places that track, uh, you know, uh, movements of, of blockchain and, and Bitcoin. And, you know, 2020, uh, uh, it was shown that 0.3% at most was uh, potentially you know, related to money laundering or crime out of the out of the payments on Bitcoin, as opposed to an estimated five percent or more of, uh, of of global GDP is crime. So you know, zero point three, which was down from like one point six the prior year. Bitcoin is a stupid way. When you when you catch a a gang of criminals, you don't find you know tre treasures and ledgers unless they're you know uh, uh, unless they're sim, sim swappers. You find suitcases of cash. When you know when when drug gangs you know show up, they don't have treasures and ledgers. They've got suitcases of cash. So that's just that's something that's just an education um, from from our side. And, and really, it's also I think we're big enough now to have lobbying clout to be able to get involved politically. I know that historically we come from an apolitical bent of uh, Austrian economics and voluntarism, but, uh, you know, you know, wonderful folks like, you know, Perry Ann Boring at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, who we've supported re re since day one, uh, you know, are out there educating people about what the blockchain is, about its opportunities for jobs, for fairness, uh, for, for innovation, uh, because let's face it, the banks are the biggest, uh, banks and farm are the two biggest lobbyists out there. And the banks don't want to have crypto succeed unless it's got the name of Goldman Sachs ETF on it. And so J JP Morgan, you know, uh, I mean, you know, the, the investment banks have been two-faced. I mean, they, and this is just how they operate. They, they go and, you know, they'll shill something that they've got you know, their bags are full and they'll, uh, they'll, 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 you know, poo poo something that they're shorting. And so JP, you know, Jamie Dimon said when Bitcoin was around, I think four or 500, um, you know, I, I would fire anybody who was so stupid as to, as to buy Bitcoin. Uh, it's going to zero. And uh, more recently when it was 40,000, uh, he was telling his, or his, his advisors were telling his uh, top clients, you should look at having at least 1% of your assets in Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. Okay, Jamie, Jamie, why didn't you tell us that when it was 400 instead of 40,000? You clearly knew, um, but you know, you were waiting until you loaded up and had a lot of it in, in you know, just like, you know, they got in a lot of trouble for, you know, shorting and then, uh, and then, and then uh, hoarding for the silver market. 
You know, uh, yes, it's so true. Uh, in the era of misinformation, a glut of information, we're still individually responsible for getting the information and we need to make decisions and looking through what people say. So um, really interesting. I, I, I think it's fascinating. I agree with you that countries are gonna have to adopt tokenization in, in order for them to, to be more efficient and keep up with modern times. So uh, I, I, this is, first of all, it's your birthday and I'm keep, I've kept you for a full hour here on your birthday, including the pre call. Yes. And I can't tell you, you know, uh, uh, what a nice guy. Thank you for your time. Uh, what I want people to, to know from here on out is whether they're an entrepreneur in the space, whether they're looking to tokenize in their own enterprise, or whether they, they want to follow you and, and understand what you see in the market, how do people see you, get a hold of you, learn more about you? Yeah, I mean, you can follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, at Michael Turpin. Uh, you can uh, tell me specifically what you're interested in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I get a lot of uh, requests from LinkedIn every day, but I do read them. And so if you have a specific thing that you're interested, I mean, I've gotten things from people that I didn't know that I wasn't referred to that turned out to be very interesting. So um, I'm just, you know, Michael Turpin. Uh, I mean, there's other platforms that people have faked me, um, but LinkedIn so far not. So uh, LinkedIn, if you look up Michael Turpin, you know, I'm the only one who's on there who's got, well, they, they say about LinkedIn is you can't fake, uh, you know, followers on, on LinkedIn, whereas you can on a lot of other platforms more easily. Uh, there's a number of fake Michael Turpins on Instagram and uh, Facebook and whatever, but I'm at Michael Turpin on almost every platform. Uh, not Michael hyphen Turpin, not Michael Turpin underscore, not Michael with an I, a, 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 letter, a number one instead of an L. Um, and, if, and I will never ask you for Bitcoin or, you know, <laughs> or, or to invest in something, right. you know, that you haven't asked me first about advice on something. So, uh, but that's the best way. And uh, yeah, I guess, um, you know, so I'm advising a number of DeFi and NFT projects. I'm also co-founder of a project I'm very excited about called Aspire. Uh, you can go to aspirecrypto.com. That's Jim Blasco, who's uh, OG out of Las Vegas. And that's really something that is innovating on both the fungible and non-fungible uh, side. Um, where you're able to go in and create your own cryptocurrency. Uh, and we're still doing an airdrop where if you go to aspirearmy.com, um, it'll get you into our Telegram group and you can get um, free tokens enough to be able to create your own, uh, you know, uh, digital, your own coin up to 92 billion of them and then your own F NFT on top of it. Uh, and the gas is, I think, a million transactions for a dollar. So we took Counterparty and, and hacked it. And uh, Counterparty actually had 30% of the entire um, coin market cap value, or rather uh, or number of coins, the 30 of the top 100 back in 2014-15. And the reason why it's no longer a thing uh, is that the, the price of gas just got too high on Bitcoin. Uh, and then people moved to Ethereum and now the price of uh, gas on Ethereum is too high. And so we designed it so that Aspire, which is ASP, it's on a couple of exchanges and Changely, uh, and we'll be on more, um, you know, basically lets you go and create something for 10 Aspire coins, which I think are going for about five or six cents right now. And again, free if you're in the airdrop. And then you use the, the Aspire gas, gasp coin that will let you do a million transactions for uh, under a dollar. And, um, you know, it takes about two minutes to build a coin um, and no programming skills. I mean, obviously, like chess, it may take a few minutes to learn and, you know, a lifetime to master. You have to figure out what the unique value of your token is. But we really see this as being big with celebrities, with brands, with corporate coins, because it's so easy to do. We've got all our open APIs published and uh, very excited about that one. Yeah, that um, and that's exciting. really kind of in the, in the N N N NFT space. Uh, uh, Upland is a game that, uh, you know, we work with in the NFT space and uh, just trying to think of some other folks that uh, people should look at because you did ask who, I've been, who I'm excited about that I've been working with. Um, and uh, Butterfly Protocol, uh, I think they do their IDO tomorrow uh, and then it's going to list on Uniswap. Uh, they're basically competing with Handshake and uh, Unstoppable Domains to basically decentralize um, your, um, your top level domains. Uh, so you can't get shut down. And uh, social.network hasn't launched yet, but I'm advising them. Um, they're going to be a true decentralized uh, DAO platform for social networks. That's exciting and necessary now in an area that you have decades of experience in. So it'll be interesting to see what you're, you're helping dream up over there with everything you've known from the 2000s and going into the 2010s and 20s. Yeah. I think the last thing I'll say about decentralized finance is that I think that the big, oh my God moment um, is gonna be when people realize who are 
you know, have, have passbook savings accounts that are getting zero, who, um, you know, are investing in T-bills that are getting 0 0.6 for like 10-year notes, uh, that decentralized finance is now paying, if you work it, you know, and you go through DeFi protocols and you sort of have that, you know, as something that you spend a few hours a week on, uh, that you can be making 30 and 40% right now, or there's these CFI DeFi protocols uh, where you can go and be making anywhere from like, you know, eight to 12 to, in some special cases, you know, high teens um, uh, on your, uh, on your, you know, stable coins. Uh, you know, it just blows people's minds. I've been trying to ex explain this to family office. They're like, well, who's the counterparty? You know, where, who, who's taking the risk? Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to stick to, I'm going to stick with T-bills, you know? And so when, so I have not been able to sufficiently explain how someone like Yield App, you know, which I'm an advisor to, um, is able to go and pay, you know, 20% uh, because they're making 40%, right? Because they're going and running and doing the yield farming for you. And I think that tokens like that are, are, are the future. Uh, I mean, once the innovation goes from crypto crazies to, um, to, to, to mainstream, not just for Bitcoin ownership, but for... Um, the ability to go and use decentralized finance as a way of being able to, you know, actually, you know, back in the old days in the '80s, you could actually get six, seven, eight percent on your savings. But that's that's gone. That's probably gone, maybe not forever, but for at least the next decade. And decentralized finance is what's going to replace it. And CFI, DeFi structures, and when you know, when the, the when the average person in America knows that they can do that, that's when you all of a sudden have a ten trillion dollar market. I think to go full circle, circle here, maybe this is in your hands, Michael, is that we, need that we need that mosaic moment like Mark Andreessen did for the internet where it makes it really easy for anybody to fully understand, understand the risk and then take action on it. And we're getting there. Right. All these things are, we've got a bunch of divergent uh, initiatives that'll come, that are coming together. Um, but yep. I think that market simplicity will, will help with that at some point. Well, I was going to say an example is, um, you, know, uh, we, we, you know, we worked on the launch of LISC uh, which is Charles Hoskins and was a, was an advisor brought me into it. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, a Puerto Rican student at the university of my who basically wanted to get involved in crypto. And he just looked on the internet and he's sitting here on the West side of the Island, you know, kind of not a lot of people there, uh, in still in school. And he's just going through projects and looking at what he thinks is cool. And he just emails them and says, I think your project's really cool. Do you need anybody to do social media? And they didn't have anybody on the team that knew how to do that. And so they paid him a whole bunch of lisk to do it. And, you know, I remember him coming up to me at a coin in the Caribbean because we hold it once a year in, the, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and he said, uh, I'm like, we're $3 million. Do I have to pay taxes? And I was like, yeah, but, you know, you're worth $3 million at least. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was just like, it was, it was very heartening to see that somebody was able to just work something that they knew and go and explore. I mean, when I first started out in going, you know, back in, in, you know, in technology in the eighties, how did I, I literally would go to trade shows like Comdex and I would go and walk every single booth. It took me three and a half days to go and at least look at every single one there. And I found some diamonds in the rough. I usually get three or four clients because you know, I wasn't getting the Samsungs, but I was getting these little guys that, you know, then grew up to be them. I mean, you know, we worked with Zoom when they were a tiny company. We worked with, you know, again, you know, Earthlink when they had a couple of people. That one I actually got because they, they, they called me, but that's because you start by just walking every show, by reading every article, by, um, you know, responding to things. Um, by And you can also earn things because certain places have art reps let you, let you earn things. Um, I'm working with Permission.io, which has something called the Ask Token, A-S-K. And, uh, you know, they let you get, uh, they, they let you earn tokens for watching, uh, watching videos, watching ad videos. I mean, that was something in the nineties people tried and everybody tried it, went out of business because the fees ruined them from PayPal and from, you know, whatever. Well, you don't have fees when you've got, uh, your own micropayments on your own cryptocurrency, the ask token. So, you know, that's, uh, I could go on for another hour, but, uh, I think you're gonna have a hard enough time editing this one down for your first episode, but. I'm no, it's really okay. We're not to, editing, uh, editing this at all. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I think okay. everybody would appreciate your appreciate your energy and um, you know how excited you are and the opportunities. I mean, just the mashup between two things you just said. When they when they're back, walk a conference hall with the Aspire token and say, "I can create a token for you." You know, to anybody in that hall. Basically. Yeah, I mean, well, Jim Jim Blasco is a is a you know who's an OG is a uh, administrator in the Ethereum 
uh, uh, forum on Facebook. And he's basically said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a moderator here. I'm like one of the founders. I'm pro Ethereum. But, you know, if you want to make a token that doesn't do this, I'll give you something free. And he's, he's like, you know, set up a couple of hundred people just from that chat group alone because he was just like saying, want to make your own token? I mean, we've got R Rose McGowan from Charm that made her own token. So, you know, we're, you know, hoping to move up the, from there to like, you know, you know, sort of larger current celebrities. Although I love Rose. I mean, I love that, that show. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, it's, we're, we're right now in, I think, the tipping point when the first year that Twitter was out there, if you remember the, the top people to follow on Twitter, I mean, I think Warren was one of them because he wrote the first book on Twitter. Right. But if you looked at the top 10 people who were most followed on Twitter, I remember Kevin Rose from Dig was one of them. They're all geeks. They're all geeks following other geeks. Literally a year after, I think this was like from 2007 to 2008, it, it switched from all of them being celebrities. And now they're all top celebrities in Instagram and, and it's all celebrities. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to have that moment in crypto where, you know, celebrities start getting involved, not for pumping ICOs, but for saying, I have 30 million followers on Twitter and most of them are fake. How do I make sure that everybody that, that, that has a coin um, is real? And that's really what the power of, uh, you know, tokenization and decentralization is you could say, hey, I'm going to give away a ticket to uh, my, my token holders, um, front row seat to the next Britney Spears concert. Um, okay, great. You know, just simply, you know, just, uh, you know, shoot me your, uh, your address or we're going to airdrop uh, randomly. You better have, you better have tokens and we're airdropping them to everybody who's in my, you know, Instagram chat. I mean, it's just, it's inevitable. Yeah, I think that's it's exciting, isn't it? Um, the emerging technology in general. So let, let's summarize the call, right? We went that just let's see if we can do that here, and I think we can. Um, you know, we we really focused this call on your on your wisdom and, and everything you've learned, not just from crypto, but everything in business. And right, you're able to spot things quickly because you're passionate about it. You take action on it. You really dig in. Uh, you've really helped people along the way uh, get their ideas out, whether through PR, you know, PR about the internet, all the way back to Earthlink and, and AOL. Um, and then, and then you're doing the same thing here. You're spreading the word. What's interesting for people, and there might be institutional investors watching this who might look at the high level thoughts, but on the low level as well, it's so wide open that somebody could just introduce the idea of cryptocurrency and take maybe an Aspire platform, for example, and start tokenizing businesses on their own and get in the middle of it. It's wide open. So I think, I think one of the lessons that you learned is, you know, there's FOMO and that's why you take action because you don't want to miss out. Before, I'm sure before it was a little bit of the money, but now it's really helping people grow and change the world. So um, that's what I got out of this, Michael. So hopefully that was <laughs> that was a message that you were trying to to spread here. And and what a fantastic uh, first episode! I'm sure we'll see you again on this. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure there's many people who are watching this who want to be in touch with you and your and your client base and so forth. So again, thank you so much. To say it one last time, happy birthday to you. I hope thank you. you. Get some cake. You know, get, get to, what's your poodle's name? Uh, the poodle's named Monkey. Oh, oh well, literally Monkey. Okay, so hopefully you and Monkey can get out, go for a nice walk, and what's a sunny day there in Puerto Rico? Well, I'm going to try out my new gym equipment. It's a beautiful sunny day. I'm going to go for a walk, and then uh, I've got a, a dinner in Old San Juan with some friends tonight, so uh, uh, life is good. Enjoy, Michael. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Look out for future episodes in the future. We're going to have great guests like Michael Turpin today. Take care. Thank you.